Welcome, Jake Jones, to uh, our, what is this now, our third episode of, yeah, it's, it's Wednesday, so we did, I guess, fourth episode of the Lives of the Saints, and right. uh, you are certainly a saint in uh, many people's eyes, uh, and we remember that we're not the ones who call us saints, God is. So we, okay, we I guess that. in God's God's realm, I'll be a saint. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And uh, Jake, I'm so excited to have you here. You have been, uh, continue to be quite a, um, an example to a lot of us, uh, young and old, uh, by your faithfulness in Christ and by the way that you live out your faith. Um, so I wonder if you just uh, give us the full introduction and uh, tell us how you got to St. David's. How long have you been there? Well, let's see. Uh, we started at St. David's in, I believe, 1992. Um, and we had looked at a number of churches in the area, to be honest with you, we scoped out parking lots, and we looked at, uh, you know, we're, we're, how were people dressed, were they formally dressed, you know, just checking things out, and we said, well, let's try St. David's first, and we never went anywhere else. <laughs> it was uh, very welcoming, and, and uh, we actually came on a weekend where everybody was uh, at camp, Camp Chick. And, but it was still everybody that was there. So we got a lot of personal attention. <laughs> right, and, right. <laughs> and so from there, it's just, it's home. Yeah, yeah. And um, and let's see, the um, uh, in that time, well, let, let's go backwards first. Okay. Um, now, you're, uh, um, not everybody's happy uh, to see that you, uh, uh, who you root for, uh, for the Ohio State-Michigan <laughs> game. <laughs> Um, but take us back to how you grew up and where you grew up and what were the kind of the spiritual underpinnings of your childhood. Okay. Um, I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and uh, was baptized, confirmed, and attended the Episcopal Church from day one, I guess. Um, I lived at one end of the block, and the church was at the other end. So to get to church, I did not have to cross the street or anything. Now, I would tell you, I came from a mixed marriage. My father was Methodist and my mother was Episcopal. And they remained that way uh, throughout. And, I, and when I was young, I would attend both, but because the Episcopal church was right down the street, you know, more than likely that's where I was going. So I would go there. Uh, Sunday school was at 9.30. And then church was at 11, so I, my sister and I would walk down the street and uh, go to Sunday school. And then at 11 o'clock, my mom would show up and we'd attend church with her, unless we could figure out a way to get out of it. <laughs> and knowing so, your so mom, uh, she probably was not going to take uh, easy excuses. No, she didn't. She didn't. So, no, that, that's how uh, I grew up in the church. I was an acolyte for, oh, probably through most of high school. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, once I went to college, I would tell you, uh, just got away from, I would say, organized religion, Chris. I, I've, I've always been a believer in God. Yeah, yeah. But I was not a big fan of uh, organized religion. And I don't know if it was, you know, all the things you would hear in the, in the press, et cetera, or just laziness or a combination thereof. Uh, but I, I had the belief, but I just wasn't into organized religion. So all through college, you know, I'd come home on, you know, Mother's Day and Christmas and those kind of things. And that's when you'd see me in the pews. But other than that, uh, you wouldn't. But I always had a relationship with God, always prayed, uh, just not into organized religion. And that's how uh, I would say until we came to St. David's, uh, you know, my kids uh, got baptized at uh, All Saints in Toledo, where, where I grew up. But Janine and I finally decided, you know, we need to at least expose these kids to organized religion just so they see and, you know, they've got some foundation and something to experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when they say the Lord works in mysterious ways, I, I think that was it. He was calling us to come back mm -hmm. to church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if these kids were probably like me. 
they went because we drug them along. Mm -hmm. But boy, did we get something out of it. So mm -hmm. that's how it worked. Yeah. Do you remember at all from your childhood, Jake, any kind of God moments or, or times of awareness or milestones in your spiritual life? You, you know, from a, a real young age, I, I would say no. More so um, maybe when, uh, oh, college time. For, I can remember a uh, couple of times, uh, whether it was a illness in the family or something like that. And you know, if, how are we going to get through this? And you're scared to death. And these things just work out. You know, they don't work out sometimes the way we want them to, but they work out the way God intends them to. Right. And I can remember one time driving back to uh, college one night, and it, it was black ice. And I bet you my car must have spun six, seven times. And it's like, I was scared to death. And when it stopped, I was shaking, but no other car came along and hit me or truck or anything else. Right. And I just, that must have been God. Yeah. Yeah. And no, then, you, there's you, others, but those are two that I just remember off the top of my head, Chris. Sure. Yeah, you do. You look at the times in which you were spared when really horrible things might have, might have happened. Right. Um, and, uh, and so when you started going back to church, Jake, one of the things you're best known for in our church is you really are... Um, a leader in terms of, of, of uh, uh, inviting us to do outreach. Mm -hmm. um, what role does outreach play in your spiritual life? Well, you know, I, I guess it goes back to, what, what does they say to uh, whom much is given, yeah. much is expected. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I think that's our calling is to give back. Yeah, no, I, I, I think so, too. Um, and so uh, in addition to attending church, uh, what practices or activities make you feel closer to God? Well, you know, one, and you got me into it, was uh, working at the Me. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was on the uh, board of trustees there, you know, you just get to know the people over there and see that they really need you. And, and you know, not me personally, but they need people to help them through their, for lack of a better term, final days, yeah. to make them comfortable, to make them safe, to make sure they're nourished. And that's our job on the board of trustees, not to do it on a daily basis, but to provide instruments for that to happen. That, that was a very uh, fulfilling um, opportunity for me. Sure, sure, sure. Now, uh, let's go back a little bit. You've been married how many years now? Two, uh, no, <laughs> uh, 40 years. <laughs> 40 years. Tell uh -huh. us how you met your wife and what role she played in okay. uh, certainly the spiritual development, uh, in your spiritual development. Um, I met my wife when I was a freshman in high school. We had the same algebra class. And, uh, you know, we had classes throughout High school together, but we did not start dating until we were seniors in high school. Yeah. And uh, she, she was one of the captains of the cheerleaders, and I was one of the captains on the football team. And somehow, oh, a friend of ours got us together. We went to a homecoming dance, and then the rest was, you know, I don't know what happened after that. Were you the uh, king and the queen of homecoming? No, we, that, that was. <laughs> I, we're a little bit too old for that. That was before the king and queen coronation. Okay. <laughs> so, so but no, she's been treated like royalty ever since. Yeah, she is. Just ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Janine, what was her faith background? What did she bring to the marriage? She was uh, Methodist, brought up in the uh, Methodist church. Uh, her mother, like my mother, they both were uh, in the choir and played. Uh, the organ, my mother was more pianist, uh, Janine's mother was organ and piano, and uh, Janine was very active in the, in the church, uh, et cetera, but uh, she was in the Methodist, and uh, I was Episcopal, and mm -hmm. say, I would, I would say similar, uh, yeah, sim similar path, uh, she was probably more active than I was in the church through high school, mm -hmm. And that, then after we got out of high school, sort of, you know, 
moved away uh, from the church, just the whole same thing. You know, I think maybe it was our generation, uh, you know, just we were into organized religion. But I, I think she would say the same thing if you interviewed her and said, you know, never lost her faith uh, in, in God, just in organized religion. So I would tell you it's a very similar path. And when we had that discussion, when we had kids, it was, you know, not a, well, back and forth on whether we need to uh, get back to church, if nothing else, for the kids. I, I would say we were a similar mindset along that. You know, you'd have to really talk to her, but I, I think she would share the same views I did in terms of getting away from the church and migrating back. So then you went down to the uh, what uh, since University of Cincinnati Bearcats. I went um, to and, and, yeah. go ahead. And, and what did, what did you study, and how were those years for you? Okay, um, well, they were interesting years. I would tell you, um, at first, uh, I was not what I would call a very good student. Okay, uh, I was one of those kids when you got away. It's like okay, I'm away, and you know, the first year was. Fun. I'm surprised they didn't kick me out, to be honest with you. Did, did you play football yeah. there? I did not. I did not. You know, I, I had uh, I had some scholarship offers to smaller colleges like uh, Finley and Defiance, and they weren't full scholarships. They were, you know, they pay room and board. I pay tuition and books or, or vice versa. But I just, you know, I knew I wasn't going to be a, in the NFL or anything like that. And it just, I had lost, sort of lost my interest in, in mm -hmm. sports from a participation standpoint for football yeah, yeah. In, anyway. So no, uh, I went now, I went to the University of Cincinnati and the reason I went there was my father was a mortician. Mm. And in the state of Ohio, there is only one uh, college of mortuary science and it is in Cincinnati. Huh. But you have, you have to have uh, well, the equivalent of an associate's degree in hours uh, to get into College of Mortuary Science. So I was going to go to Cincinnati, get an associate's degree in business, and then migrate to uh, Cincinnati College of Mortuary Science. Yeah. But after I got there and finally decided I really wanted to be a student, I um, decided I didn't want to be a mortician, and i proceeded to continue in the College of Business. So I, I uh, graduated with a degree in marketing. And uh, once I got out, I decided I did not want to come back to Toledo. Uh, so I looked for jobs and uh, ended up with Rockwell International in Florence, Kentucky. And hmm. that's how I got started. No kidding. No kidding. Yeah. So gosh, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a, big part of your story you mentioned there. So was your father at all uh, unhappy that you yes. decided to go into mortuary science? Absolutely. He, you know, he wasn't a, you know, pound the table, you know, disown me as a son kind of guy. He, he was uh, more of the, uh, oh, just disappointed, you know, uh, uh -huh. more of the passive aggressive approach to it. <laughs> Boy, I can't understand why you wouldn't want to do that. But Hey, if you want to, you know, sort of so throw my life work away, that's fine. You know, that, that kind of. <laughs> <laughs> no guilt. Don't feel guilty at all. Yeah, but, don't, you know. Hey, if this is what you want to do, right. you know, it's okay. But, uh, but you know, he got over that, I think, rather quickly. But it, did it hurt him? Oh, sure. I, I, it, I'm sure it did. Well, I mean, you've, you've got to really let people go where they're supposed to go. That is true. That you is know. true. That um, and that can, that can be a heck of a um, an albatross to have around one's neck to do a job that they really don't want to do. Right, right. Because eventually they won't be very good at it because that's not what they want to want to do. Right, and, right. You know, I, I think in his in his in his heart he was disappointed. In his head, he knew if yeah. this isn't what I want to do, then that's not right. Great. Right, right, right. And so, so uh, you did, I mean, that, that's an, it's an interesting position, I would imagine, mortuary science. So growing up in a house where dad was getting called at any time of day or night. Absolutely. And we lived uh, at that point until, oh, I think either, I think until I was 12, we lived on top of the, the funeral home. You know, funeral home was downstairs. We were upstairs. And I think, yeah, if I got out of eighth grade is when we 
move to another house. But for the first 12 years, that, that was home. Mm -hmm. and, now, and then you have a sister you mentioned? Yeah, I have a sister. Unfortunately, she passed away. Oh, boy. Uh, she passed away at the age of 47. Uh, so it's been 20, let's see, 1997. So what's that, 23 years? Yeah. Uh, she, she lived in uh, Colorado, uh, got ill in like very short period of time, and she was gone. Oh, my goodness. And did she leave a husband and some uh, no. nieces and nephews here? No, nope, no. Nope. Uh, she was uh, never married. Um, so, no, she didn't have and yeah. uh, never had kids. Yeah. How heartbreaking for your mom? Uh, terribly. Uh, yeah. But I would tell you, she handled it better than my dad. Yeah, so your dad was still around at that point? Yeah, my dad was. Now, he passed away two years later. Okay. Uh, okay. Probably part of that from a broken heart, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. He and my sister had a very close relationship, and um, it broke him. Wow. It but, you know, who could ever imagine? Even, you know, I think my sister was... 47. Yeah. I think she was 46 or 47 when she passed away. And, um, you know, even though, you know, she wasn't a kid, she's still my parents' kid. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, um, so then the, you, you grew, uh, grew up on top of the, 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 uh, the funeral, funeral home there. Home? And did your dad ever expand it or did he ended up selling it out or what happened to it? He's, he, uh, he ended up just closing it because nobody, now, he and my uncle, it was actually called Jones Brothers Funeral Homes because my dad started it. My dad grew up in Lima, Ohio, yep. and he started the first funeral home there, and his younger brother went to College of Mortuary Science in Cincinnati as well. When he got out, my dad turned that one over to him and moved to Toledo to start another, another one. Okay. But uh, my uncle had three boys, and none of them wanted to take on the business either yeah, so yeah. between the four sons of, of the two none of them wanted to be in the business so um the one in lima was sold to a company out of dayton and my dad just you know closed closed his now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay um so anyway you you grew up in uh in that in that kind of household what about janine she grew up uh, which did she live far from you your wife um, she was probably 10 minutes. Um, I'm talking in Michigan terms now. In Toledo terms, probably about five miles. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. probably about five miles away. Okay. And then so uh, you guys uh, met, you married, you started working for Rockwell in, uh, in Kentucky. What did you think of that job? What did you think? What was your I, work? Uh, I, I, I liked it. Uh, I started out uh, is what they called a purchasing expediter. So all I did was chase parts. Uh, and soon thereafter, I got a, a bump to what they called a junior buyer and uh, moved up from there. But I enjoyed it. It was fun. It was challenging. And it paid money. And how did you get from, from Florence, Kentucky to Detroit? I, uh, I came up through the organization in uh, Florence, to the point I was a purchasing manager and they were looking to uh, centralize corporate purchasing and I interviewed for for that and they offered me the job um, and that was in 1984 so I started off with Rockwell in 78 and um, took the promotion and transferred up here in 84 and that's where I finished up um, Lots of different jobs after that, but that's eighty. That was, it was uh, did Rockwell own uh, with Arvin Meritor? Yeah, what what uh, happened? Um, Rockwell uh, had multiple businesses from the you know aerospace division to uh, automotive to uh, radios to meters. It, it just had yeah. you know yeah. multiple businesses. And over time, they decided, well, let's focus on some core competencies. And I think in 2000 or 2001, they spun off the automotive division, and then it became Meritor. 
Okay. And so, so you, you uh, went or somehow got into the automotive division. Mm -hmm. I was already, that, I was always in the automotive division of Rockwell. So I, I was always it. Okay. automotive. Okay. 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 And so um, were you, uh, what was the, what was the final position you were in when you retired? I was a uh, senior director of uh, global aftermarket purchasing when, when I, when I left. Okay. And, and that entailed some tr travel, didn't it? Too much travel. Yeah. I had, yeah. Um, I had an organization in uh, Sao Paulo, uh, South America. I had an organization in Mono, uh, or Brazil rather. Uh, I had one in uh, Monterey, Mexico, uh, one in Zurich, uh, one in uh, Belgium, um wow and so were you you that necessity to travel to those places at times huh yeah yeah <laughs> you, you know I, I say that you know it afforded me to see a lot of places but yeah. you know the first trip someplace at least for me was fun because you've never been there before yeah. after that it, it becomes old habit because you're not there as a tourist you don't have time to really see anything you know you get there you go to work you stay there for two or three days, just about the time you get acclimated to the time zone, you come back home. Right, right, right. <laughs> and that's how you do it. So uh, so what kind of parts are we talking about at Arvin Meritor? Yeah, these are, uh, when I say automotive, now we had two divisions. It's a good good question. Had two divisions. We had a, a pass car division and we had a heavy truck division. I always worked in the heavy truck division. So here in, in, in the pass car, it was... Um, and pass means passenger, right? Oh, I'm sorry, passenger car, right, yeah. right, it's passenger car. You know, they would make, uh, oh, emissions, filters, um, um, window regulators, glasses, you know, they even made at one point, uh, like the hoods for the uh, Chrysler Vipers and things like that. Mm -hmm. So they made uh, automotive passenger car components. Our division that I was in, heavy truck, we made um, axles, uh, transmissions, brakes, uh, and driveline components for heavy trucks. When I say heavy trucks, it's those 18 wheelers that you see going across the road are the, the main ones, but also construction uh, product, military, and as small as maybe uh, UPS truck components. Okay. Okay. And, um, and so you're, uh, gosh, you got to be pretty darn familiar then with a lot of these trucks then, um, and a lot of the parts that had to go with them. Sure. Do you have an affinity for, for vehicles outside of, I mean, personally? You know what? I was never a real big uh, car guy. Um, I mean, I, I, I like and appreciate, you know, mm -hmm. not like an old 55 Chevy or something, but yeah. since I do not... Um, possess the capability of, you know, doing anything more than maybe even uh, changing the oil on a car one time. Okay. It just, well, I'm not a gearhead. How about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you knew your parts and, you know, well enough to... I, I know enough to get around to try. At one point, uh, I would even tell you my most satisfying job. I ran, uh, I was in manufacturing for the brake division, I was in charge of uh, brake manufacturing in North America. And I had uh, five plants that I would um, travel around to. I was gone every week, as a matter of fact, but we made brakes and I got to know more and more about the production process and what to do and what not to do uh, very quickly. But I would tell you, it was probably my most satisfying job at, uh, mm -hmm. at Meritor. Mm -hmm. Well, starting is good, but knowing how to stop is important, too. That is true. <laughs> that is true. Uh, and after, uh, let's see, it was, I think on my retirement papers, after 32.8 years, it was time to stop. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and I'm curious, Jake, as to the kind of um, uh, spiritual lessons that uh, one learns in the business world. 
and how certainly mm-hmm. God never abandons us. God's always with us. And what kind of lessons that you, you take from uh, being an executive for 32.8 years? I, I think uh, you, the biggest thing I would tell you I learned was um, you have a big responsibility to, I, I hate to say take care of your people, uh, but to ensure that your people are safe. Anytime I went to a plant and, and I was doing a review, the first thing I would ask them is show me your safety numbers for the month or the week or the year or whatever. And I made it a point to go out into the plant and not just meet with the managers and the line leaders, et cetera, but to get to know the people on the line. And, and I, I think that's uh, important. And that's what I call leading versus managing is get to know the people. And if you treat people well, and if you show them respect, uh, you'd be surprised what they do. And all they're looking for is you to acknowledge them as human beings. And you know what, it's no different than like when we have the SOS, uh, people just, you know, those people, they're different life than you've had, but they're still people. Right. and respect them. And I think if you do that, you, you, you can be successful. But that's the first thing I would tell you I learned and the most sustaining thing I learned is respect people, get to know people, uh, acknowledge them when they uh, do great things. And you also have to address them when things aren't what they should be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You have to yeah, do both, but do it in a very respectful manner. Uh, they, they, you know, they say people leave jobs uh, rarely because of the pay or uh, the benefits, but almost always because of how their boss treats them, uh, how That's they true. feel treated by, by others I, around I, them. I, I sincerely believe that. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, uh, let's see, Jake, let me ask you this. Uh, there's an author named Anne Lamott, and she says that there are basically only three kinds of prayer, uh, mm-hmm. help, uh, thanks, and wow. Uh, which one of these describes the type of prayers you most often rely on? Help, thanks, or wow? Well, that's an easy one. Thanks. Yeah. I uh, I am not a big uh, the the prayers of petition. I, you know, I'm not even sure. This is just me. I'm not even sure they're needed sometimes. I think God, He always knows. So if he knows, I don't need to petition him. Mm-hmm. But when he does, I need to thank him. So I, I would tell you 95% of my prayers, Chris, are thanks. Thanks, yeah. her prayers. Yeah. You know, because, and I also, <laughs> I also think I, my mom and I have had this discussion. I think God, uh, sometimes he has a sense of humor. And when you petition him, he answers your prayers. He may not answer them the way you want, though. And right. it, it's like, whoa, I'm sorry I asked for that. But <laughs> in, in all seriousness, I, I just, uh, I'm not a big, uh, I won't say believer. I'm just not a big uh, utilizer of prayers and petition because, again, I think he's always there. But I, I am huge on the Thanksgiving side. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, let's see. So you've had a career of, of 33 years. And how did you begin then to pivot once you finished? You mentioned that you started some serious volunteer work with a rest home, St. Anne's Mead. Um, and uh, you've also, uh, you've also uh, shined your golf clubs uh, a couple times. <laughs> Yeah, I have. You know what? It was uh, it was time for me to go. Uh, I just you, you have that feeling. I, you know, when I first uh, thought about it, I thought I'd work until I was sixty. My 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 game plan all along was to retire at uh, sixty, and I did it at well just before I turned fifty-seven because I just felt it was time. You know, instead of lingering on and you know, becoming an obstacle or, you know, throwing tantrums or whatever. It's just, it was time to go. So, you know, I, I left with no regrets. Um, I, you know, the place did great by me and hopefully they would say I did great by them, but it was just time to leave. Now, that being said, when I first, that first day of retirement was like, oh, wow, what, what do I, what do I do? I looked forward to it for so long. But when that first day hits you, you know, it sort of smacks you in the face because yeah. you still wake up at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning. That doesn't change. 
And when you do, it's well, okay, but I don't have a teleconference. I don't have a place to go. I don't have to catch a flight. So what am I supposed to do? Right. It's almost like anxiety. Yep. And uh, at least for me, it was. And it was like that probably for two, three weeks, you know, with, you yep. know, the anxiety descended as you went along uh, until you say, okay, this is what you asked for. Now, now what are you going to do? Right. Uh, and you just get into a routine, routine of just taking your time. You're not on a schedule, you know, you don't have to, well, back then, you know, look at my Palm Pilot or this and, you know, you live and die by the phone. And, you know, if I forget my phone, sometimes it, it's, it's okay. You just slow down your pace of life. And I guess that's why I come in and smell the roses because you have time to do that, but it is a yeah. transition. At least it was for me. Sure, sure. And so, um, do you have uh, many aspirations for your retirement? Um, you've got a you've got a new grandchild. I have a new grandchild. So my aspiration, if you ask me right now, is to just spoil the living daylights out of that little girl. Okay. And send her back to her parents at night. So if she wants to have you know Coca Cola or Pepsi, I'll feed it to her, and then she can go back home to mom and dad. There you go. There you go. No, you no go. will probably not be in my vocabulary very often. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a um, problem, but at least I admit it. <laughs> well, you know, you have been donating your time, Jake. Uh, it's not that you're sitting home. Um, you know, certainly to St. Anne's Mead Rest Home, certainly to your parish. Um, I mean, you continue to be active and, and using, uh, you know, one of the best uh, resources any congregation has is the wisdom of people like you who've worked for 32.8 years and bring with them certain sensibilities and uh, understandings of how life works. Um, the, uh, I, I, I quote you every once in a while, Jake, uh, and, and I, I know you've got many more of them, but, uh, uh, but what you once uh, said in terms of giving advice to, to people and in their personal relationships is that if it feels good to say, don't say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I wish I could take complete credit for that, but I had a boss uh, that actually uh, started that. And, and he, you know, he just said, Jake, when you feel like you got that gotcha moment in a meeting and you feel like, boy, I could just lay him out with this line. He says, if it's going to feel that good to say it, don't. And I just, I think, you know, it's trite, but true. You know, those gotcha moments come back to bite you moments. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, Jake, have you ever had the feeling that God wanted you to do something? You know, I, I guess for, I won't say forever, but one of the things I've always thought is God just wants us, um, for lack of a better term, I'll start off with uh, do the right thing. You know, um, follow your dreams. Uh, don't infringe upon others. Don't judge others. Mm -hmm. um, take care of those who need to be taken care of. And again, um, to whom much is given, much is expected. Mm -hmm. So be that in your family, be it the person you help open the door for somebody the, or take care of those that are in need. I, I just think, you know, strive to, that to me is what God is. You know, he's in us. Right. So now, you, you be God-like and you're doing the right mm -hmm. thing. I think that he calls us to do that every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what, uh, what advice um, can you remember that uh, came from your parents that, that's memorable, your mom or your dad or both? Probably more, uh, well, you know what, they both did, but it was always uh, be respectful. Um, yeah. You know, and, and my dad was in adamant ways. Like, I remember one time my mother asked me something, and I said, what? I'll never do that again. You know, just answering that, you know, it was always, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, and you be very respectful of your mother, and here's why. He, he was, but you know, he was almost down my throat telling me that. But from both of them, it was just be respectful of, of, of others, no matter what what you do. I think that mm -hmm. was the the biggest thing is just be respectful. Mm -hmm. What advice, Jake, would you give your younger self? 
Good question. Um, you know what? I would tell you that uh, for every action, there's consequences. And those consequences can be good. Those consequences will, can be bad. But just keep in mind, whenever you do something, uh, it will result in, in consequences. You know, it, it, it just is. And that's not a threat to old Jake or, or, or anything like that. And I tell, I told my kids that too, is just, there's always consequences to every action. Mm -hmm. Do you have, uh, do you have any, uh, any regrets? Uh, maybe a road you wish you'd taken, uh, a you promotion know you'd wish you'd taken? Um, I guess looking back, I wish I had been a, uh, a much better student in undergrad. I was very uh, unfocused and did not uh, apply myself to the potential I, I was given. Now, when I went to graduate school, I, I made it a point to really try to excel. But in my undergraduate years, I, I did not. And, and, and it was a waste of uh, money and time, to be honest with you. I don't think I was ready for college when I went to college. I'd have been better off waiting at least a year, if not two. Other than, uh, other than that, uh, maybe not having uh, moved away from organized church as much as I did from high school to, you know, my late 20s, early 30s. Uh, but okay. I, I tell you the former more so than the latter, because I, I never, I never gave up on God. I just gave up on the, right. I won't say gave up. I just left the church. I didn't leave God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you name three favorite foods? Oh, let's see. Yeah, I think I can. Uh, steak, potato chips, <laughs> And um, uh, and ice cream. Okay, favorite ice cream flavor? Um, probably mint chocolate chip. Oh, there you go. There you go. Um, do you have? It, uh, can you name a, a uh, Jones family tradition? Yeah, every week the family and extended family get together. Um, it got to be a pain in the butt, to be honest with you, over time. But there was always people at, at our house. And there were, you know, not just blood relatives, but I'd say extended. I, I can't tell you how many people I grew up calling aunt and uncle that were of no relationship to me. You know, my, my dad was an excellent uh, cook. And people would actually bring their food over for my dad to cook, like shrimp or chicken or or whatever. Really? And that would be, that's how our weekend would start on either a Friday or a Saturday and there'd be a shrimp fry or, you know, whatever. And, but we always have people at, at, at the house. Mm -hmm. and, and my mom and dad were both very, uh, very social people, I guess, in his business. He, he should have been, but they were both in all kinds of organizations, with all kinds of people. There was always people at our house. So the tradition was uh, entertain every weekend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to well, the that's point that I got tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, which spectator sport do you enjoy most, Jake? Uh, football, oh, baseball, basketball, hockey? College football, Ohio State. <laughs> okay, okay. And you played, uh, were you a halfback? I was a uh, halfback and defensive back. Okay. Yeah, play both sides. Okay. Okay. Um, what person, well-known person, would you mm -hmm. like to have dinner with? Would you like to have dinner with you and your wife and invite them over? Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. Would you invite Michelle? Her first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why, why do you say that? I just find them as very uh, interesting people. Yeah. Um, just, I would like to hear about their journey from, you know, like you're asking me, from high school and, and younger years. How, how, how did they ever think? Because I, I got to tell you, in my lifetime, I never thought I'd see a black president. Just never even crossed my mind. Right. Yeah. And I want to know, how do you get that kind of vision and, and dream to say, you know, I can do this. 
And so I'd really just, just to walk, walk me through how, how did this journey start? Now, how, um, in your, uh, uh, in your lifetime, how have you seen race relations improve, deplete? Um, what, what is your, uh, what is yeah. your take on the status I, 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 and where it's going? Sure. I think uh, maybe even every year, every moment, I think race relations get better. Uh, you know, nothing, it didn't, nothing is a finger snap away. Uh, you know, when I was young, uh, I don't know if you remember Jet, uh, Jet Magazine. It's a little five by seven yeah. black publication that came out yeah. uh, in Ebony, I think came out once a month. Well, in there, you know, that was probably one of the first magazines I ever started reading. And in there would be articles. And usually every week there was an article about uh, this person uh, being hung in somewhere in, in the South and, you know, the police are looking for him, yada, yada, yada. And I'm telling you, I had a fear when I was eight, nine, 10, 12. I never wanted to go anywhere in the South. It just scared the ever little yeah. mm -hmm. crap out of me. And then I would hear, uh, you know, I told you we had these family gatherings and I would always hear, you know, here's what happened to us growing up. And, and here's what happened here. here I'll give you a, a quick one from my mom about the Episcopal Church. Um, my mom grew up in a place called Newark, Ohio, real small place outside of uh, Columbus. And uh, 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 they went to the, she and her mom went to the Episcopal Church. And I said, well, what made you pick the Episcopal Church? Well, the Catholic Church wouldn't have us, uh, neither would any of the other churches, but at least the Episcopal Church would let us in. I said, okay, so they treated you fairly. Well, sort of. Uh, at first, uh, even the Episcopal Church would not let them take communion. Wow. You could not take communion. And then after a while, they said, well, you can take communion, but you had to take communion after every white person in the congregation had taken communion. Wow. So, you know, that, that, that's how that started. But um, I will tell you, you know, even with all, all that background, you know, yeah. you see things get better. And, and my dad always told me, treat people the way they treat you. Don't treat them because the color of their skin says, oh, this person's trying to do me wrong, or this person's going to do me right. Just treat people as you would treat them and never back down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would tell you that that's been it. You know, most of the, I would tell you, most of my career, uh, especially as I got up to director levels, I might be in a meeting and I'd be the only black person in the meeting. But yeah. Hey, it is what it is. I never felt, you know, anybody shunned me and I would never shun anybody else. And if you uh, demand respect, you get respect. Yeah. Uh, like I said, you'd be always respectful, but you call out things that need to be called out and uh, you celebrate things uh, or acknowledge things that, that are right. Um, I think um, if you don't interact with people, you never know and understand people. So I think a lot of this boils down to interaction. Don't, you know, everybody talks about fake news. I don't know if it's fake news, but the news doesn't tell you what's right and wrong. The news tells you mm -hmm. what's going to keep you watching the news. You have right. to interact with people in order to know where they're coming from, why they're coming from here, uh, what, what they want to do, et cetera. So I think as long as the lines of communication and your mind are open, things will continue to get better. And, and I, you know what, I, I believe that and I see it in like my, my generation to my kids' generation, you know, I think race relations are better. Do they have a ways to go? Answer is absolutely yes. And I, I told my kids that, you know, I had to tell my son growing up, you know, if you're riding a car, you got two or three other buddies. This is what you need to do if the police stop you. You know, I shouldn't have to 
tell him that, but I, I feel obligated to do so. So, you know, there are things that aren't perfect in the world, but are they getting better? Yes. And I think they will continue to get better. Mm -hmm. Well, Jake, you're, you're a heck of a hopeful um, and an inspirational uh, voice in many, many different ways. Uh, but as we wrap up here, just one final question mm -hmm. for you. Okay. Uh, we're on lockdown, which is one reason we're doing this. Is, mm -hmm. uh, it's for us to keep in touch. But fill in the blank. As soon as the emergency rules are lifted, I'm going to make a beeline to? Whoa, that's easy. Um, I'm going to make a beeline to Toledo, Ohio and kiss my mom. Your 100-year-old mom. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh, Jake Jones, great to be with you. Thank you so much for taking some time out of, uh, out of your day. Thanks for having me. And uh, we will see you again soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.